Welcome to a new video. I am full of book recommendations today. This is a, if you like this book, you may like this book. I'm pretty sure you will like this book if you like that book. Sometimes you just want to keep reading a, a, a book that has similar writing style, like a similar author, but not the same author, or a similar genre or trope, but something different, you know, similar but the same. And that's what I'm going to give you today. I have new releases, fiction, non-fiction, a couple of classics, and all up there are nine book recommendations, or probably 18, I guess, if you haven't heard of the original, if you like this book, there are potentially 18 recommendations, so let's get into it. I love rock and roll biographies, and Daisy Jones is fiction, yes, but it reads like a biography. So if you liked Daisy Jones and the Six, I recommend Just Kids by Patti Smith. It is non-fiction and it is not about a band, but it has quite an ensemble cast. Just Kids by Patti Smith is a beautifully written, poetic memoir, which is very fitting because Patty is a poet first and foremost, and ultimately I see it as a raw coming of age story and a love story. It's set in New York City in the 60s and 70s and it's described as a prelude to fame for two particular young artists, one of which is Patty and the other is Robert Mapplethorpe, who is a photographer. So it's like their coming of age story in New York City them, you know, grappling with them wanting to be artists and them striving for their art and surviving on air and art through through this time in their life. But we follow Patty through her childhood and she goes to New York fairly young. She knows she wants to be an artist very young. That is the calling she has on her life. She meets Robert and they have this connection, this soul's connecting. They are lifelong friends. They are lovers. And eventually they, they, they go on this journey together. They become artists together. And I think it is a great companion to Daisy Jones and the Six, especially because it has that, that when it gets to the seventies in this book is really when it shines because they are in the late sixties and seventies, they're in the Chelsea hotel, which is people are living in the Chelsea hotel and it becomes this commune for artists. People are living there, you know, they're paying their rent through their art, which is quite Quite amazing and it will feed those Daisy Jones desires that you have. There is a lot of name dropping in here, Joni Mitchell, Janis Joplin, Andy Warhol, all those names that you would expect in that era and I think it's a great option. If you haven't read it I would recommend it because Patti Smith's writing it will grip you from the get-go. She is such a beautiful writer and I did not know a whole lot about her. She is such a I feel like there's a bit of an ambiguity to her artistry. Like she's not one, she's not an artist in one vein only. She is a poet, she is a photographer, she is a songwriter, singer. She is so many, she is a, an artist in so many forms. And I think that's maybe why I hadn't yet really understood what she was known for. Plus I was born in the late seventies. Um, so she was a bit before my time, but anyway, I recommend it. it it is a great companion to Daisy Jones and the Six. I think you'd love it. Something a little bit more G-rated. If you love Anne of Green Gables, which I know a lot of my viewers do love these kind of books, this is such a comfort read for many of us. And I want to remind you that if you love Anne of Green Gables, I am 100% sure that you will love Heidi by Joanna Spirey. From the get-go, there are some initial similar themes of an orphan, a young girl who is displaced, and she is put with a... a I mean, Heidi goes to live with a family member and doesn't live with a family member. She's gone to live with strangers, but there is that similarity of an orphan going to live with people she doesn't know. But she finds ways to make the best of the resources she has and she endears these people to her. And ultimately they love her for who she is, which in both cases is a complete bright ray of sunshine. Heidi was published in the late 1800s, but it is such a beautiful read today. And it feel, it's filled with so much hope. I really did find so much hope in it. I think this would have been such a perfect book to read through the pandemic. I think it would have been ideal. There's not a lot of fluff. It's written very simply, very straightforward. The writing is quite easy. It's, it's quite a fast read. And I don't see it mentioned as much as other books like Anne, but it should be up there. It is such a beautiful book of hope and faith and love. And it's a real testament of what living with and in nature can do for our soul and our health. 
which I think is something that Anne knew deep down in her heart. Uh, so I, I highly recommend that. If you are a lover of Anne of Green Gables, Heidi by Joanna Spirey. Now, if you are a fan of Claire Keegan and small things like these, or any Claire Keegan book for that matter, I, I deliberated on which recommendation to give you for this one, to be honest. And at first I was going to recommend Clear by Karis Davies, but I thought that was a little bit too obvious. So my recommendation, if you like Claire Keegan and small things like these, is Drift by Carol Lewis. Carol Lewis is a Welsh author, and my understanding is that Drift is the first book that she published in English. She's written a number of books that have been published in Welsh. I'm not sure if they've all been translated into English. English but this is the first one that was written in English or published in English and I am so so grateful for it because it was most definitely one of my most favorite books of this year and I absolutely loved it and I see so many similarities between this book and Claire Keegan's writing. Drift is set on the coast of Wales and it is set it has a very small set of characters, which is similar to Claire Keegan's books and stories. We have Neffin and Joseph, who are a brother and sister, who live in a small cottage on the top of this blustery cove on the coast of Wales. Neffin is a little bit of an enigma, and we find that she's being medicated to suppress these oddities that she has. Uh, we don't exactly understand what they are, but we know there's something going on with her, and she's being medicated. She does not like it. But she has a strong connection to the sea and the land and there's a little bit of Welsh folklore woven through this book and you can see that she has a strong connection to the land. And we meet a third character called Hamza who is a Syrian map, map maker and he is actually being uh, detained, incarcerated at a military base nearby to where Nefin and Joseph are. And through circumstances, he is being transported from his um, where he's been incarcerated and a violent storm ends up bringing Hamza and Nefin together. And they have this connection um, and through more circumstances, they've, they've been joined together and now they're going to be pulled apart. And it is such a beautiful book, such a beautiful story, very quiet and unassuming and very brief in the writing, which is very similar to Claire Keegan's, which I love. I love when an author allows you to breathe in between the writing, which is something that both Carol Lewis and Claire Keegan allow you to do. And they, there's, there's also a little bit of magic in here. And sometimes I feel that uh, there's a couple of, if you've read some of Claire Keegan's short stories, some of her short stories have a little bit of that as well. So I, I really do think there's a little bit of similarity that if you love Claire Keegan, I think you will really enjoy this one. It's a real beautiful, uh, both character and plot driven story about lost identities, uh, about finding a place of home. I, I really love it. The next book is one I don't physically have with me. I've given it to someone was The Berry Pickers by Amanda Peters, I wanna say. Uh, if you have read The Berry Pickers, I think you will really like Take My Hand by Dolan Perkins Valdez. This was something I read a few years ago and it's really stayed with me. And there's a few reasons why I think you will really enjoy this if you liked Berry Pickers. First of all, both books have a they have an element of historical truth in them. The Berry Pickers has a lot of historical relevance of how the Mi'kmaq people in North America were treated. And Take My Hand has a lot of, it has some fascinating, fascinating American history in here that I didn't know about, but I'm not American. So maybe you guys didn't, you knew about it. So Take My Hand is set in 1973, Montgomery, Alabama. And our main character is named Civil Townsend. And she's just finished nursing school and she is ready to get into her community and do some good. She has such a strong uh, community spirit. With a name like Civil, you know that she's been brought up with a really strong sense of, um, you know, community uh, service and she knows what she needs to do in this world and she's ready to get into that. And so she goes to work at the uh, Montgomery Family Planning Clinic and she is going to help young girls in understanding about contraception and their bodies and, and helping them, that kind of thing. And 
but the, her first two clients are these two sisters who are 11 and 13 years old. And these two girls have not kissed a boy, let alone have any boyfriends on the horizon. So she's quite confused as to why these are the two girls that she is having to provide birth control to because they're not even sexually active. But they are poor, they are black, and there are other people who are in charge of their welfare benefits who are making decisions for them for their health, including giving birth control to these girls. So Sybil really comes to love these girls. She she really does look after them and she really does have a care for them. But one, you know, she continues doing her nursing, but one day she comes to find that something unthinkable has happened to these girls and it sets her on this trajectory that she never foresaw when she started this community community nursing journey and it is it is absolutely horrifying the things that happened to these girls and to real people in real life and it was truly shocking and I highly recommend that you read this book just to find out this particular chapter in American history I think it's worth knowing and understanding especially with a lot of the dialogue around the the lack of agency over women's bodies going on now in North America um, I think it is worth understanding what happened in the 70s uh, with women who didn't have control over their own bodies because they were poor and they were black and they didn't have any control. So I, this was just such a fantastic read. It's very easy to read. It's written in first person. It's a very fast read. And no doubt once you finish it, you'll probably be jumping on the internet like I did to find out all the facts around it to see how much truth is in this historical fiction novel. I highly recommend it. The next book I wanted to recommend is for fans of 84 Charing Cross Road. Uh, I love this book. I read it for the first time this year and I really, really enjoyed it. Some of the things I liked about it was I did enjoy the letter aspect of it, but I enjoyed the commentary. I enjoyed the comedy. The social commentary was one thing, but the comedy aspect, the, just the, the characters. And these are real people. It was right. It was really quite funny. I enjoyed the story of was it the Duchess of Bloomsbury Street. Helen Banff went to London and she went to her book launch and how she was meeting everybody and she was traveling and I really enjoyed that aspect. But it gave me such a real uplifted feeling. And so for people that enjoyed that book, I wanted to recommend Cold Comfort Farm. This was something that you probably a lot of people know about, but maybe they haven't read. And I read this for the first time a few years ago. And I think it's, it's, a little difficult at first to read because there is a lot of dialect dialogue. I think they're in Sussex. But some of the dialogue is a little bit tricky, like, shame on me, Miss Rubin. You know, like, it's tricky, a little bit tricky at times. But there is a lot of comedy. There are some fun characters. It is escapist. It leaves you with an uplifted feeling. There is, at the centre of it, there is a character who everyone gravitates towards and she is, you know, just making everyone feel good. Uh, so I think that Cold Comfort Farm would be a great recommendation if you enjoy uh, 84 Charing Cross Road. Now, Circe is no doubt a book that most of you have read, if not heard of, by now. If you have not read it, please, please, please go read it because it is one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. It really is a, a marvel, a marvel of storytelling. And so when I think of recommendations for people that might like Circe, there is no shortage, absolutely no shortage of Greek mythology retellings. So my recommendation, if you like Circe, is Ariadne. And I have a few reasons for this. So Ariadne by Jennifer Saint is something I read this year for the first time. Ariadne is the daughter of King Minos. Uh, her brother is the Minotaur. She has a sister named Phaedra. She is not happy with her existence. Every year there is a sacri sacrifice to her brother, the Minotaur. There's a lot of bloodshed. It's horrible. She does not enjoy it. Her mother has been shamed horribly by the Minotaur being born. It's it's a horrible thing that she's she hates, understandably. So when Theseus, a prince of Athens, turns up and he is going to slay the Minotaur and he is going to take Adri Ad uh, Ariadne and he is going to marry her and he is going to take her sister and they're going to live happily ever after in Athens, she is like, yes, let's do it. And so she helps Theseus kill the Minotaur. She gives him access and he kills the Minotaur and away they go. But he abandons 
Ariadne on an island and that's where the similarity between Circe and Ariadne is for me in the sense that she is stuck on an island where Circe is also Circe is banished to an island but the difference between Ariadne and Circe is that Circe Ariadne does not have she is not a witch she's not a god she's not a nymph or a demigod she is just a woman and she doesn't have any wiles or ways that she can get herself off that island other than being a woman. And so I, I, I think just that uh, atmosphere of the island I think is quite evocative of Circe. So if you enjoyed that, that environment, you'll enjoy it. The god Dionysus is at play in this as well. Uh, so I would recommend Ariadne if you're a fan of Circe. Another non-fiction recommendation. If you like H for Hawk, I have a recommendation for you. H for Hawk by Helen MacDonald was a book that I read just this month. I really enjoyed it. It was something I've wanted to read for a while and it did not disappoint at all. But if you read this, if you loved this, then I would recommend Graft by Maggie McKellar. So straight up, there's a couple of similarities between these books. They deal with grief or death. They also deal with the natural world. There's a beautiful nature writing in both books. There are some specifics in both of these books about animal rearing that you never knew you wanted to know. I never knew I wanted to know about how to, about lambing season or how to, you know, rear a goshawk, but there you go. And both books are a bit of a journey through the seasons. There is a seasonality to them. H for Hawk is a memoir that follows Helen MacDonald as her father has passed away and she throws herself into her lifelong dream of rearing a goshawk. And it is a beautiful, beautiful memoir. Whereas Graft, on the other hand, is a little bit different. It does deal a little bit with grief, but mainly about death in the sense that uh, Maggie McKellar is on a farm and they are raising sheep and death is an everyday part of farm life. It's a memoir of motherhood. It says it's a memoir of motherhood and family and a year on the land in a sheep, a merino sheep farm in Tasmania, Australia. So it's a little bit less about grief in the sense of H is for hawk, but it does have that death element of living on a farm and death is just everywhere. That's what you deal with on a farm. It's just a part of life. Honestly, reading a book about someone's grief is not easy, but having it peppered with information about other things like nature, like animal rearing, is really, really comforting. There's something about it. It gives a bit of a buffer. So it was something I appreciated in H's for Hawk that uh, she would be talking about going through her grieving process and then it would flip to uh, a process of quite technical talk about raising a goshawk. And it was similar in Graft. There would be a lot of talk about, you know, maybe it's death or losing um, some animals and then there would be something about wild swimming. And I I do appreciate that. So it is really well balanced in that sense and both of these books have that so it's not all doom and gloom there is a lot of beauty there is a lot of hope in both of these books and both books are such a poetic observation of the natural world of human behavior animal behavior and of our emotions and it really they really are both very honest and I I would recommend both of these books but if you like one or the other I would recommend reading one or the other Okay, this one's an oldie, but a goodie. Where the Crawl Dads Sing by Delia Owens. I read this a number of years ago and I finally watched the movie this month and it had been such a long time. There was quite a few surprises for me, which was nice. But if you have read Where the Crawl Dads Sing, I would recommend reading Shadows of Winter Robins by Louise Wolhutter. Both books are beautifully written. The writing is lovely and captivating. Both books are a coming of age story. Both books have a thread of mystery and murder. I feel that Shadows is Shadows of Winter Robins is a faster paced book and in my, my opinion it is a better book but I haven't read Crawdads for a while so maybe I've just been, you know, I read this one more recently. But Shadows of Winter Robins is a new release and it's actually set in Western Australia where of course Crawdads is set in uh, North America in Car Carolina, I think, one of the Carolinas, North Carolina. 
So Shadows of Winter Robins starts off with our, our main character is named Winter Robins. She lives in, um, in England. She is a young girl. I think she's around about eight years old. And she's living in England with her mum and her dad and her brother. And her mum dies suddenly. She quite suddenly, very abrupt. They end up going to live with Winter's mother's her, her mother's family in Australia. And it's quite a, a coastal, a remote coastal location. So Winter does come to love her family very much. It doesn't have that same volatile relationship that um, Kaya, Kaya, I think it is, has in Crawdads. But you can see that through her child's eyes, she's seeing something a little bit different to maybe what's going on and that there maybe there are some hidden meanings into what she's witnessing as a child. When she's older, she starts to see some stories on the news and she it starts to pique her interest that something untoward has happened on this property and that maybe someone in her family has, maybe there's something that's gone on that has made her upbringing Maybe it hasn't been as idyllic as she remembers and that's where this thread of mystery and murder comes into it. And there are twists and turns like you would not believe. The writing is so good. I didn't see them coming. My mum read this. She was like, I saw it come. She's so much more intelligent than I am. She she loved it though. She actually said that she felt the writing was very similar to Tim Winton's writing. Um, I th it's just beautiful, so beautiful. So I would highly recommend this if you really, if you enjoyed Crawdads by Delia Owens. And my final recommendation is for fans of Pride and Prejudice. If you are a Pride and Prejudice fan, then I really do feel that you will love The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem. So this story was published in the 1920s and in this beautiful little novel, four very different women respond to an advertisement to holiday and to let an Italian an Italian castle for the spring. They most definitely want to escape the gloomy, gloomy London weather. And when they get there, the Mediterranean weather does wonders for them. They instantly feel a change. Um, but as they go on, like the, there's such different personalities. And as they go on, each of these women start to realize that maybe they aren't as happy as they thought in their lives and in their marriages in London. And they start to kind of figure out, they're trying to figure out, well, how can I stay this happy as I am right here, right now in this beautiful place and in this location and take that back with me to London, which a lot of us feel, right, when we go on holidays is how can we take this feeling back with us? But I think the connection between Pride and Prejudice is it does have a little bit of that comedy aspect that you do get from Jane Austen novels. Some of the characters are just quite... I think they're very Austen-ish, you know, you do have like an older lady who's very, very set in her ways and some of the ways that characters come up against each other is quite funny. So I think that if you enjoy Pride and Prejudice, you will enjoy The Enchanted April. It's all about female companionship, about love, about transformation. It leaves you with a very, very warm feeling in your heart and I, I recommend it. But those are my those are my recommendations. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope there are some there for you. Please let me know if there's any new ones on your radar from from this video. As always, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you again soon. Bye.